Track 34. The Woman in White. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. Read by Tim Bulkley of BigBible.org. Track 34. The story continued by Walter Hartwright. 3. Four months elapsed. April came, the month of spring, the month of change. The course of time had flowed through the intervals since the winter peacefully and happily in our new home. I had turned my long leisure to good account, had largely increased my sources of employment, and had placed our means of subsistence on surer grounds. Freed from the suspense and the anxieties which had tired her so sorely and hung over her so long, Marian's spirits rallied, and her natural energy of character began to assert itself again, with something if not all of the freedom and vigour of former times. More pliable under change than her sister, Laura showed more plainly the progress made by the healing influences of her new life. The worn and wasted look which had prematurely aged her face was fast leaving it, and the expression which had been the first of its charms in past days was the first of its beauties that now returned. My closest observations of her detected but one serious result of the conspiracy which had once threatened her reason and her life. Her memory of events from the period of her leaving Blackwater Park to the period of our meeting in the burial ground of Limeridge Church was lost beyond all hope of recovery. At the slightest reference to that time she changed and trembled still. Her words became confused, her memory wandered, and lost itself as helplessly as ever. Here, and here only, the traces of the past lay deep, too deep to be effaced. In all else she was now so far on the way to recovery, that on her best and brightest days she sometimes looked and spoke like the Laura of old times. The happy change wrought its natural result in us both. From their long slumber, on her side and on mine, those imperishable memories of our past life in Cumberland now awoke, which were one and all alike the memories of our love. Gradually and insensibly our daily relations towards each other became constrained. The fond words which I had spoken to her so naturally, in the days of her sorrow and her suffering, faltered strangely on my lips. In the time when my dread of losing her was most present to my mind, I had always kissed her when she left me at night, and when she met me in the morning. The kiss seemed now to have dropped between us, to be lost out of our lives. Our hands began to tremble again when they met. We hardly ever looked long at one another out of Marian's presence. The talk often flagged between us when we were alone. When I touched her by accident, I felt my heart beating fast, as it used to beat at Limeridge House. I saw the lovely answering flush glowing again in her cheeks, as if we were back among the Cumberland Hills in our past characters of master and pupil once more. She had long intervals of silence and thoughtfulness, and denied she had been thinking when Marian asked her the question. I surprised myself one day, neglecting my work, to dream over the little water-colour portrait of her which I had taken in the summer-house where we first met, just as I used to neglect Mr. Fairley's drawings to dream over the same likeness when it was newly finished in the bygone time. Changed as all the circumstances now were, our position towards each other in the golden days of our first companionship seemed to be revived with the revival of our love. It was as if time had drifted us back on the wreck of our early hopes to the old familiar shore. To any other woman I could have spoken the decisive words which I still hesitated to speak to her. The utter helplessness of her position, her friendless dependence on all the forbearing gentleness that I could show her, my fear of touching too soon some secret sensitiveness in her, which my instinct as a man might not have been fine enough to discover, these considerations and others like them kept me self-distrustfully silent and yet I knew that the restraint on both sides must be ended, that the relations in which we now stood towards one another must be altered in some settled manner for the future, and that it rested with me in the first instance to recognize the necessity for a change. 
the more I thought of our position, the harder the attempt to alter it appeared. While the domestic conditions on which we three had been living together since the winter remained undisturbed, I cannot account for the capricious state of mind in which this feeling originated, but the idea nevertheless possessed me that some previous change of place and circumstances, some sudden break in the quiet monotony of our lives, so managed as to vary the home aspect under which we had been accustomed to see each other, might prepare the way for me to speak, and might make it easier and less embarrassing for Laura and Marian to hear. With this purpose in view, I said one morning that I thought we had all earned a little holiday and a change of scene. After some consideration it was decided that we should go for a fortnight to the seaside. On the next day we left Fulham for a quiet town on the south coast. At that early season of the year we were the only visitors in the place. The cliffs, the beach, and the walks inland were all in the solitary condition which was most welcome to us. The air was mild. The prospects over hill and wood and down were beautifully varied by the shifting April light and shade, and the restless sea under our windows, as if it felt, like the land, the glow and freshness of spring. I owed it to Marian to consult her before I spoke to Laura, and be guided afterwards by her advice. On the third day from our arrival I found a fit opportunity of speaking to her alone. The moment we looked at one another, her quick instinct detected the thought in my mind before I could give it expression. With her customary energy and directness she spoke at once, and spoke first. "'You're thinking of that subject which was mentioned between us on the evening of your return from Hampshire,' she said. "'I've been expecting you to allude to it for some time past. There must be a change in our little household, Walter. We cannot go on much longer as we are now. I see it as plainly as you do, as plainly as Laura sees it, though she says nothing. How strangely the old times in Cumberland seem to have come back. You and I are together again, and the one subject of interest between us is Laura once more. I could almost fancy that this room is the summer-house at Limeridge, and that those waves beyond us are beating on our seashore. I was guided by your advice in those past days, I said, and now, Marian, with reliance tenfold greater, I will be guided by it again. She answered by pressing my hand. I saw that she was deeply touched by my reference to the past. We sat together near the window and while I spoke and she listened, we looked at the glory of the sunlight shining on the majesty of the sea. Whatever comes of this confidence between us, I said, whether it ends happily or sorrowfully for me, Laura's interests will still be the interests of my life. When we leave this place, on whatever terms we leave it, my determination to wrest from Count Fosco the confession which I failed to obtain from his accomplice goes back with me to London as certainly as I go back myself. Neither you nor I can tell how that man may turn on me if I bring him to bay. We only know by his own words and actions that he is capable of striking at me through Laura, without a moment's hesitation or a moment's remorse. In our present position I have no claim on her which society sanctions, and which the law allows to strengthen me in resisting him, and in protecting her. This places me at a serious disadvantage. If I am to fight our cause with the Count, strong in the consciousness of Laura's safety, I must fight it for my wife. Do you agree with that, Marian, so far? To every word of it, she answered. I will not plead out of my own heart, I went on. I will not appeal to the love which has survived all changes and all shocks. I will rest my only vindication of myself for thinking of her, and speaking of her as my wife, on what I have just said. If the chance of forcing a confession from the Count is, as I believe it to be, the last chance left of publicly establishing the fact of Laura's existence, the least selfish reason that I can advance for our marriage is recognized by us both. But I may be wrong in my conviction. Other means of achieving our purpose may be in our power, which are less certain and less dangerous. I've searched anxiously in my own mind for those means, and I have not found them. Have you? No, I've thought about it too, and thought in vain. In all likelihood, I continued, the same questions have occurred to you. 
in considering this difficult subject which have occurred to me. Ought we to return with her to Limeridge now that she is like herself again, and trust to the recognition of her by the people of the village, or by the children at the school? Ought we to appeal to the practical test of our handwriting? Suppose we did so. Suppose the recognition of her obtained, and the identity of the handwriting established. Would success in both those cases do more than supply an excellent foundation for a trial in a court of law? Would the recognition and the handwriting prove her identity to Mr. Fairley, and take her back to Limeridge House against the evidence of her aunt, against the evidence of the medical certificate, against the fact of the funeral and the fact of the inscription on the tomb? No. We could only hope to succeed in throwing a serious doubt on the assertion of her death, a doubt which nothing sort of a legal inquiry can settle. I will assume that we possess, what we have certainly not got, money enough to carry this inquiry through all its stages. I will assume that Mr. Fairley's prejudices might be reasoned away, that the false testimony of the Count and his wife, and all the rest of the false testimony, might be confuted, that the recognition could not possibly be ascribed to a mistake between Laura and Anne Catherick, or to handwriting be declared by our enemies to be a clever fraud. All of these are assumptions which, more or less, set plain probabilities at defiance, but let them pass. Let us ask ourselves what would be the first consequence, or the first questions, put to Laura herself on the subject of the conspiracy. We know only too well what the consequence would be for we know that she has never recovered her memory of what happened to her in London. Examine her privately or examine her publicly, she is utterly incapable of assisting the assertion of her own case. If you don't see this, Marian, as plainly as I see it, we will go to Limeridge and try the experiment to-morrow. I do see it, Walter. Even if we had the means of paying all the law expenses, even if we succeeded in the end, the delays would be unendurable. The perpetual suspense after what we have suffered already would be heart-breaking. You're right about the hopelessness of going to Limeridge. I wish I could feel sure that you're right also in determining to try that last chance with the Count. Is it a chance at all? Beyond a doubt, yes. It is the chance of recovering the lost date of Laura's journey to London. Without returning to the reasons I gave you some time since, I am still as firmly persuaded as ever that there is a discrepancy between the date of that journey and the date on the certificate of death. There lies the weak point in the whole conspiracy. It crumbles to pieces if we attack it in that way, and the means of attacking it are in the possession of the Count. If I succeed in wresting them from him, the object of your life and mine is fulfilled. If I fail, the wrong that Laura has suffered will in this world never be redressed. Do you fear failure yourself, Walter? I dare not anticipate success, and for that very reason, Marian, I speak openly and plainly as I have spoken now. In my heart and my conscience I can say it. Laura's hopes for the future are at their lowest ebb. I know that her fortune is gone. I know that the last chance of restoring her to her place in the world lies at the mercy of her worst enemy of a man who is now absolutely unassailable, and who may remain unassailable to the end. With every worldly advantage gone from her, with all prospect of recovering her rank and station more than doubtful, with no clearer future before her than the future which her husband can provide, the poor drawing-master may harmlessly open his heart at last. In the days of her prosperity, Marian, I was only the teacher who guided her hand. I ask for it, in her adversity, as the hand of my wife." Marian's eyes met mine affectionately. I could say no more. My heart was full, my lips were trembling. In spite of myself I was in danger of appealing to her pity. I got up to leave the room. She rose at the same moment, laid her hand gently on my shoulder, and stopped me. "'Walter,' she said, "'I once parted you both for your good and for hers. Wait here, my brother, wait, my dearest, best friend, till Laura comes, and tells you what I have done now." For the first time since the farewell morning at Limeridge, she touched my forehead with her lips. A tear dropped on my face as she kissed me.
She turned quickly, pointed to the chair from which I had risen, and left the room. I sat down alone at the window to wait through the crisis of my life. My mind in that breathless interval felt like a total blank. I was conscious of nothing but the painful intensity of all familiar perceptions. The sun grew blindingly bright. The white sea-birds chasing each other far beyond seemed to be flitting before my face. The mellow murmur of the waves on the beach was like a thunder in my ears. The door opened, and Laura came in alone. So she had entered the breakfast-room at Limeridge House on the morning when we parted. Slowly and falteringly, in sorrow and in hesitation, she had once approached me. Now she came with the haste of happiness in her feet, and the light of happiness radiant in her face. Of their own accord those dear arms clasped themselves round me. Of their own accord the sweet lips came to meet mine. "'My darling,' she whispered, "'we may own we love each other now.' Her head nestled with tender contentedness on my bosom. "'Oh,' she said, innocently, "'I am so happy at last.' Ten days later, we were happier still. We were married. 4. The course of this narrative, steadily flowing on, bears me away from the morning time of our married life, and carries me forward to the end. In a fortnight more, we three were back in London, and the shadow was stealing over us of the struggle to come. Marion and I were careful to keep Laura in ignorance of the cause that had hurried us back, the necessity of making sure of the Count. It was now the beginning of May, and his term of occupation at the house in Forest Road expired in June. If he renewed it, and I had reason, shortly to be mentioned, for anticipating that he would, I might be certain of his not escaping me. But if by any chance he disappointed my expectations and left the country, then I had no time to lose in arming myself to meet him as I best might. In the first fullness of my new happiness, there had been moments when my resolution faltered, moments when I was tempted to be safely content. Now that the dearest aspiration of my life was fulfilled in the possession of Laura's love, for the first time I thought faint-heartedly of the greatness of the risk, of the adverse chances arrayed against me, of the fair promise of our new life, and of the perils in which I might place the happiness which we had so hardly earned. Yes. Let me own it honestly. For a brief time I wandered in the sweet guiding of love, far from the purpose to which I had been true under sterner discipline, and in darker days. Innocently, Laura had tempted me aside from the hard path. Innocently, she was destined to lead me back again. At times, dreams of the terrible past still disconnectedly recalled to her, in the mystery of sleep, the events which her waking memory had lost all trace. One night, barely two weeks after our marriage, when I was watching her at rest, I saw the tears come slowly through her closed eyelids. I heard the faint murmuring words escape her, which told me that her spirit was back again on the fatal journey from Blackwater Park, that unconscious appeal, so touching and so awful in the sacredness of her sleep, ran through me like fire. The next day was the day we came back to London, the day when my resolution returned to me with tenfold strength. The first necessity was to know something of the man. Thus far the true story of his life was an impenetrable mystery to me. I began with such scanty sources of information as were at my own disposal. The important narrative written by Mr. Frederick Fairley, which Marian had obtained by following the directions I had given her in the winter proved to be of no service to the special object with which I now looked at it. While reading it, I reconsidered the disclosure revealed to me by Mrs. Clements of the series of deceptions which had brought Anne Catherick to London, and which had there devoted her to the interests of the conspiracy. Here again the Count had not openly committed himself. Here again he was, to all practical purposes, out of my reach. An next returned to Marion's journal at Blackwater Park. At my request, she read to me again a passage which had referred to her past curiosity about the Count, and to the few particulars which she had discovered relating to him. The passage to which I allude occurs in that part of her journal which delineates his character and his personal appearance. She describes him as 
not having crossed the frontiers of his native country for years past, as anxious to know if any Italian gentleman was settled in the nearest town to Blackwater Park, as receiving letters with all sorts of odd stamps on them, and one with a large official-looking seal on it. She is inclined to consider that his long absence from his native country may be accounted for by assuming that he is a political exile. But she is, on the other hand, unable to reconcile this idea with the reception of the letter from abroad bearing the large official-looking seal, letters from the continent addressed to political exiles being usually the last to court attention from foreign post offices in that way. The considerations thus presented to me in the diary, joined to certain surmises of my own that grew out of them, suggested a conclusion which I wondered I had not arrived at before. I now said to myself, what Laura had once sent to Marion at Blackwater Park, what Madame Fosco had overheard by listening at the door. The Count is a spy. Laura had applied the word to him at hazard, in natural anger at his proceedings towards herself. I applied it to him with the deliberate conviction that his vocation in life was the vocation of a spy. On this assumption, the reasons for his extraordinary stay in England so long after the objects of the conspiracy had been gained became, to my mind, quite intelligible. The year of which I am now writing was the year of the famous Crystal Palace exhibition in Hyde Park. Foreigners in unusually large numbers had arrived already, and were still arriving in England. Men were among us by hundreds, whom the ceaseless distrustfulness of their governments had followed privately, by means of appointed agents to our shores. My surmises did not for a moment class a man of the Count's abilities and social position with the ordinary rank and file of foreign spies. I suspected him of holding a position of authority, of being entrusted by the government which he secretly served, with the organization and management of agents specially employed in this country, both men and women, and I believed Mrs. Rubell, who had been so opportunely found to act as a nurse at Blackwater Park, to be in all probability one of their number. Assuming this idea of mine had foundation in truth, the position of the Count might prove to be more assailable than I had hitherto ventured to hope. To whom could I apply to know something more of the man's history and of the man himself than I knew now? In this emergency it naturally occurred to my mind that a countryman of his own on whom I could rely might be the fittest person to help me. The first man I thought of under these circumstances was also the only Italian with whom I had intimate acquaintance my quaint little friend, Professor Pesca. The Professor had been so long absent from these pages that he has run some risk of being forgotten altogether. It is the necessary law of such a story as mine that the persons concerned in it only appear when the course of events takes them up. They come and go, not by favour of my personal partiality, but by right of their direct connection with the circumstances to be detailed. For this reason, not Pesca alone, but my mother and sister as well, have been left far in the background of the narrative. My visits to the Hampstead Cottage, my mother's belief in the denial of Laura's identity, which the conspiracy had accomplished, my vain efforts to overcome the prejudice on her part and on my sister's, to which, in their jealous affection for me, they both continued to adhere, the painful necessity which that prejudice imposed on me of concealing my marriage from them, till they had learnt to do justice to my wife. All these little domestic occurrences have been left unrecorded, because they were not essential to the main interest of the story. It is nothing that they added to my anxieties and embittered my disappointments. The steady march of events has inexorably passed them by. For the same reason, I have said nothing here of the consolation that I found in Pesca's brotherly affection for me, when I saw him again after the sudden cessation of my residence at Limeridge House. I have not recorded the fidelity with which my warm-hearted little friend followed me to the place of embarkation when I sailed for Central America, or the noisy transport of joy with which he received me when we next met in London. If I had felt justified in accepting the offers of service which he made to me on my return, he would have appeared again long ere this. But though I knew that his honour and his courage were to be implicitly relied upon, I was not so sure that his discretion was to be trusted, and for that reason only I followed the course of my inquiries alone. 
it will now be sufficiently understood that Pesca was not separated from all connection with me and my interests, though he has hitherto been separated from all connection with the progress of this narrative. He was as true and as ready a friend of mine still as he had ever been in his life. Before I summoned Pesca to my assistance it was necessary to see for myself what sort of man I had to deal with. Up to this time I had never once set eyes on Count Fosco. Three days after my return with Laura and Marion to London, I set forth alone for Forest Road, St. John's Wood, between ten and eleven o'clock in the morning. It was a fine day. I had some hours to spare, and I thought it likely, if I waited a little for him, that the Count might be tempted out. I had no great reason to fear the chance of his recognizing me in the daytime, for the only occasion when I had been seen by him was the occasion on which he had followed me home at night. No one appeared at the windows in the front of the house. I walked down a turning which ran past the side of it, and looked over the low garden wall. One of the back windows on the lower floor was thrown up, and a net was stretched across the opening. I saw nobody, but I heard in the room first a shrill whistling and singing of birds, and then the deep ringing voice which Marian's description had made familiar to me. "'Come out on my little finger, my prit prit pretties!' cried the voice. "'Come out and hop upstairs. One, two, three, and up. Three, two, one, and down. One, two, three. Twit, 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 twit!' The Count was exercising his canaries as he used to exercise them in Marion's time at Blackwater Park. I waited a little while, and the singing and whistling ceased. "'Come, kiss me, my pretties,' said the deep voice. There was a responsive twittering and chirping, a low, oily laugh, a silence of a minute or two, and then I heard the opening of the house door. I turned and ret retraced my steps. The magnificent melody of the prayer in Rossini's Moses, sung in a sonorous bass voice, rose grandly through the suburban silence of the place. The front garden gate opened and closed. The Count had come out. He crossed the road, and walked towards the western boundary of Regent's Park. I kept on my own side of the way, a little behind him, and walked in that direction also. Marion had prepared me for his high stature, his monstrous corpulence, and his ostentatious mourning garments, but not for the horrible freshness and cheerfulness and vitality of the man. He carried his sixty years as if they had been fewer than forty. He sauntered along wearing his hat a little on one side, with a light jaunty step, swinging his big stick, humming to himself, looking up from time to time at the houses and gardens on either side of him with superb smiling patronage. If a stranger had been told that the whole neighbourhood belonged to him, that stranger would not have been surprised to hear it. He never looked back, he paid no apparent attention to me, no apparent attention to any one who passed him on his own side of the road, except now and then when he smiled and smirked with an easy paternal good-humour at the nursery-maids and the children whom he met. In this way he led me on, till we reached the colony of shops outside the western terraces of the park. Here we stopped at a pastry-cook's, went in, probably to give an order, and came out again immediately with a tart in his hand. An Italian was grinding an organ before the shop, and a miserable little shrivelled monkey was sitting on the instrument. The Count stopped, bit a piece for himself out of the tart, and gravely handed the rest to the monkey. "'My poor little man,' he said, with grotesque tenderness, "'you look hungry. In the sacred name of humanity I offer you some lunch.' The organ-grinder piteously put in his claim for a penny from the benevolent stranger. The Count shrugged his shoulders contemptuously, and passed on. We reached the streets and the better class of shops between the new road and Oxford Street. The Count stopped again and entered a small optician's shop, with an inscription in the window announcing that repairs were neatly executed inside. He came out again with an opera glass in his hand, walked a few paces on, and stopped to look at a bill of the opera placed outside a music-seller's shop. He read the bill attentively, considered a moment, and then hailed an empty cab as it passed him. "'Opera box office!' he said to the man, and was driven away. I crossed the road, and looked at the bill in my turn. The performance announced was Lucretia Borgia, and it was to take place that evening. The opera glass in the Count's hand, his careful reading of the bill, and his directions to the cabman, all suggested that he proposed making one of the audience. 
I had the means of getting an admission for myself and a friend to the pit by applying to one of the scene painters attached to the theatre with whom I had been well acquainted in past times. There was a chance at least that the Count might be easily visible among the audience to me and to anyone with me, and in this case I had the means of ascertaining whether Pesca knew his countrymen or not that very night. This consideration at once decided the disposal of my evening. I procured the tickets, leaving a note at the professor's lodgings on the way. At a quarter to eight I called to take him with me to the theatre. My little friend was in a state of the highest excitement, with a festive flower in his buttonhole, and the largest opera glass I ever saw hugged up under his arm. "'Are you ready?' I asked. "'Right, all right,' said Pesca. We started for the theatre. End of Track 34